three old friends uh, on this panel uh, who have uh, been really at the forefront of uh, Chinese internet studies for many years. Uh, I'm not going to be able to uh, really mention all their broad range of work, but one thing that's uh, important to mention is that their, their research covers uh, does cover a very broad range. Uh, Jack's work on network society, but also earlier work on internet censorship and, and, uh, and, and similar uh, and different kinds of uh, focus. Um, David's work on online society and the application of uh, Bakhtin's uh, concept of the carnival to the analysis of uh, Chinese internet culture is also very fascinating work. and. Uh, covers a Chinese internet uh, culture um, in a very um, insightful new way. And Wu Wei, um, we all know as well, has uh, done um, pioneering work on gender and ICT develop development in China for many years. And I still remember at the beginning of my work, I was already discovering Wu Wei's work on ICT and, 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 and women's uh, conferences and, and so on. At any uh, rate, uh, the presentations today that they're going to make are somewhat unusual for a conference panel because both are um, papers of a literature review. So reviewing, uh, reviewing the field of internet, Chinese internet studies, uh, they're unusual, but they are unusually important as well uh, because I think they, um, they indicate the level of self-consciousness, self-reflexivity in the development of the field. And I've read uh, Jack's paper, uh, and they also mention in their review a number of other reviews that have already been published, uh, which also suggests you know, there's uh, already a history of uh, doing this kind of self-reflection, self-criticism, self-criticism in the, in the field, and about the identity formation of the whole um, field of uh, Chinese internet studies. Uh, we have uh, a good amount of time, so I'm, I'm going to give the two panelists uh, hopefully adequate time for their presentations and then also leaving enough time for interactions and discussions. Thank you, Bobin. Uh, I want to explain a little bit. There are two slight changes, okay? Uh, probably if you look at the program, okay? One is uh, the year, okay? We, the, we, we basically, this is a large, like Bobin said, uh, literature review, okay? So the earliest uh, broadly defined China ICT study, okay, we found was from the year of Tiananmen, right? And it's actually, uh, there are multiple pieces in 89 talking about Chinese students overseas using the internet using email okay, to, uh, uh, for so social movements. But we stopped at 2012, because 2011 is still too new, so, uh, and we are only halfway through 2013. Okay, so the, there's one uh, change in terms of the time framework. Uh, the other change is the order of the, uh, uh, of the authorship. All right? uh, uh, I always thought about this project as a uh, Wu Wei's project, okay? We, she and I, we work very closely, and, uh, but then she insists to put me in, in, the, in the beginning, okay? Actually, it, uh, as I will explain, she started to do a very similar, okay, project, and even the database was from her earlier uh, presentations at CERC, right? and uh, so this is a follow-up of her earlier work, but she insists, okay, uh, to put me, uh, you know, in the beginning so that I can take most of the blames, which I'm very glad, okay? <laughs> and she and her students actually did uh, the, really most of the, the bulk of the, the good work, okay? And so our task uh, uh, today, okay, uh, is to reflect on how much, okay, China, uh, Chinese internet research or ICT studies in general have changed, especially when we talk about the world has been changing, okay? The, the world of digital technologies has been changing, okay? Email is no longer the primary way for, okay, social movement, like we talked about in 1989, and even, okay, BBS, okay, uh, P2P, broadband is no longer the latest popular thing, okay, the technology changes a lot, okay? And also the players, okay, the rise of China, 
Okay, it's not only about the country, the government, but also the corporation. Okay, the uh, netizens' uh, body. Okay, so all these changes are happening in the media industry. Do we see similar change? Okay, in the air for the academy. So that's uh, our, one of our initial questions. And we began the paper, okay, with an uh, uh, article from Dan Schiller when he was talking about, this was uh, from a journal called Global Media and Communication. This was the inaugural issue, okay, of that journal. And he mentioned there are two poles of growth for the global capitalist economy. One is IT, okay, or ICT, okay, computer, mobile phone. The other is China. All right? And so these are the two poles that are, have been driving okay, the global economic growth. Okay? And then so we, are, uh, uh, we hypothesize okay, with this kind of uh, moment, okay, this is an important moment for global media industry. It's also an interesting time for media and communication scholarship. And that examining China ICT studies can reveal much about the inter intellectual currents and also the undercurrents okay, that we are trying to detect. So our task today is not about, okay, this is not about a causal relationship between the industry and the academy, okay, be it one way or two way, robust or tenuous. Our goals are relatively humble and simple. Okay, in fact, our analysis is still ongoing. Okay, Bu Wei probably will be you know, sharing more on the, uh, you know, our, next, uh, our next step. All right? We are only uh, you know, uh, maybe 70-80% okay, through this uh, analytical process. So we're very humble and simple to share this uh, work in progress. Uh, basically, we set out to first uh, find out about the overall characteristics of China ICT studies and also to compare the Chinese and English literatures, okay, from uh, uh, you know, both inside the mainland China and outside, okay, that include Hong Kong, Taiwan, okay, and uh, uh, other countries, right? And uh, so uh, we compare these two bodies of literature for a comprehensive picture of the field. How research in mainland China differs from overseas studies, how they share similar strengths or weaknesses, how both have evolved over time and why. By ICTs, we understand not only the internet, but also a broad range of electronic media from email to mobile phone services. By China ICT studies, we refer to a multidisciplinary field built on scholarly traditions of social sciences and humanities to understand ICTs in China. Given the increasing prominence of China ICT studies over the past decade, Several reviews of the field have already been conducted, okay, like Gobin Go just mentioned. One of them, okay, was uh, actually I started this, okay, uh, with my uh, Enfield supervisor, Joseph Manchen, okay, that was my first English book chapter ever published, okay, <laughs> was in Professor Monroe Price, you know, uh, uh, you know volume called Media Reform, Dem Democratizing the Media, Democratizing the State, okay, so that was the uh, Oh, uh, uh, sorry, this was another book, okay. That was my first chapter, but, but my second <laughs> chapter was also, my, in English book was also for uh, uh, Monroe, and it was, it was in a book called uh, Chi uh, uh, Internet and the Academy. Okay, so that's the 2004, okay. I start to, my, my brain start to short circuit, okay, in between <laughs> so many, you know, uh, great uh, project that Monroe has uh, invo involved me in. So in this uh, uh, review, okay, uh, down by um, myself and uh, uh, Joseph Manchen, uh, basically it's a, it, we look at a, like a three dozens of articles or reports. Okay, there are not that many uh, China Internet studies published by the time. And we looked on the one hand at the actors. So who are the, when other people were studying uh, internet in China, who were the movers and shakers? Okay, so that's one. Uh, factor. The other is uh, uh, how do they see internet being operated? Was it more of a, for example, censorship? Okay, that's one mode of operation. For example, business, okay, e-commerce, that's another mode of operation. So the operational processes and also the uh, evaluation of outcomes, okay, what uh, are they finally looking at, okay, the uh, dependent variables, so to speak. 
and uh, identified uh, we identified scholars from different uh, social sciences uh, disciplines, and also we categorized the publications, including both journal articles and books, according to their levels of analysis. Okay, are they very micro level study of individuals or families? Okay, or macro level at the national, international, global level? Okay, or in the middle, the mezzo level? Okay, that. Uh, mostly about organizations or regions or towns and uh, cities. So this review reveals several important patterns, one of which is drastic difference between scholars in mainland China and those outside. Okay? The overseas scholarship tend to prioritize po uh, po political issues like social control, like censorship. Okay? Peng Hua already talked about this. Whereas domestic research tend to stress the impact of internet on mass media uh, or on Chinese culture. Okay, this was 10 years ago. And uh, one year later, uh, Randy is sitting here okay, uh, with uh, uh, his very capable students. Okay, so the Kluwer and Young 2005 piece okay, from uh, the Information Society okay, uh, journal. Uh, this one is uh, focusing exclusively on English language publications by overseas scholars. Okay, and that pool actually was you know, drawn from the CIR bibliography. Okay? Uh, the, that's the virtual community before we have the offline CERC okay, annual meeting. Okay? Uh, uh, Randy and I, we started that in November 2000. Okay? So one of the things that this online community of scholars have been doing is to share a bibliography. Okay? So, Randy and uh, Kluver and Young, okay, draw from that uh, literature, and uh, it was uh, 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 there were twenty six, okay, uh, okay, uh, okay. The, the sample size was large. I think it was like sixty something, okay, the, the total sample size, and then they discovered out of these uh, uh, sixty some uh, publications that they have discovered, these were all English language publications. 26, the most uh, common topic was actually the internet, the IT industry, okay? And it was followed by political control and also human rights issues, okay? But the number one was actually telecom IT industry. Of all the disciplines, scholars from international relations and area studies actually were the most productive. And they were followed by media and communication scholars and also telecom an you know, analysts. And this means, okay, because the, that was a special issue about internet studies, okay, of uh, uh, different uh, area, different disciplines. But this means far more, th this is the main finding from uh, the, the Kluber and Young uh, research, is that far more research on the Chinese internet is happening outside the self-defined internet study area, you know, rather than within the internet study, like you go to AOIR. Okay, but it's actually much more interdisciplinary. The third uh, piece here is by uh, Ron Wei. I think Wei was here yesterday. I haven't seen him today yet. Okay. And this one was published in the Asian Journal of Communication. And uh, it uh, examines Chinese language research published within mainland China. And uh, they draw from uh, Zhiwang, the uh, Chinese Journal Full Text Database, which is also where okay, uh, Bu Wei and I, we also draw our sample from that database. And the main finding, okay, one is that um, most of the uh, research actually concerns about very technical, okay, in, the, in mainland China, okay, about technical, descriptive, uh, even, you know, atheoretical discussions. They're not very much theory-based. Uh, and uh, um, there are not very much uh, discussion about political or developmental uh, issues. And then we move on to uh, Bu Wei's okay, earlier presentations okay, and in CERC uh, 10. Okay, and this one, uh, in this study, uh, she uh, uh, included 650. Okay, so in terms of number, this was the largest uh, at that time. Uh, uh, Chinese language papers, okay, and we call this database the JNC uh, database, okay, the journalism and the communication. These are the mainstream journalism and communication publications within mainland China, especially four journals, okay, Xinwen uh, Yu Yanzhou, Journalism and Communication, Xian Dai Modern Communication, 
uh, international communication, Guoji Xinwenjie. Okay, the first three are published in Beijing. And then uh, Journalism Society, Xinwen Daxue. This one is published in Shanghai by Fudan University. So all uh, the uh, database for this uh, JNC study is drawn from okay, these uh, four uh, journals. And uh, uh, Bu took a very different approach from all the previous ones. Okay? In the pre previous uh, reviews, uh, people have been looking at what has been studied. Okay? But uh, Bu actually posed the question, what are the ignited and excluded aspects in new media studies in mainland China? All right? And then the uh, uh, study find out that there's a lot of focus okay, on the issues of media market. Okay, so this is consistent with earlier Kluger and Young, uh, you know, finding. But also, uh, the, at the same time, there are very little, this, uh, you know, uh, study from especially the uh, disadvantaged groups in, in China, right, the neglected parts. And uh, last but not least is our chair, okay, when, when we wrote this uh, article, we didn't know Guo Bing is going to be our, ch our chair. All right. But Guo Bing also uh, uh, had a meta review. Okay, it's one book, book review. So this also is a unique review of five books published between 2010 and 2011. Okay, within this a little more than one year framework, five books. All, uh, mo uh, four of them are in English, one in Chinese, okay, were published. Okay, so you can see how the field has been very productive in not only journal article publication, but also book uh, publication. And uh, uh, Guo Bin's uh, piece is beautifully written and uh, full of insights. Okay? Uh, if you haven't read it, you should definitely read it. And uh, uh, he find out that these works, okay, all these books that have been published, uh, represent a lively and dynamic, abate controlled image of Chinese internet culture. And there is a persistent uh, problem in the study of media and technology. Okay, in all these books that uh, he was looking at, this persistent problem is a deterministic view of technology. Okay, the, so he was calling for going beyond techno uh, determinism. And also, political and commercial forces have penetrated deeply into cyberspace everywhere, and China is no exception. And uh, by this, okay, actually, if we look at who are the publishers, okay, this is a very important self Okay, reflection, who are there publishing these books? So, so many of them, okay. Three of the five books that uh, Guo Bin reviewed actually were published by, surprise, Routledge. Okay, so the China ICT studies, okay, uh, you, you must have seen this, right? There is not a coincidence, okay, that what's been published is also next to our coffee, okay, or tea, okay. <laughs> and China ICT studies is blessed, okay, with, uh, you know, because we enjoy all these benefits, okay, that other, okay, inter area studies or internet studies doesn't enjoy, okay, and uh, they were brought by this huge market demand, okay, for no more knowledge, more information, okay, uh, more methods, okay, to understand the Chinese internet you know, as perceived by major publishers, and Routledge is only one of them. But is the field also spoiled by this surge of attention to the extent that it becomes increasingly self-content, hence unmotivated, even unable to reflect on its systemic limitations? Okay, so this is a tough question that uh, Wei and I, we, we started our uh, research. So um, basically, we are uh, uh, Wei and I. We have been doing this as one of the things we, we've been collaborating very closely in the past six years on a long-term project on social development, on uh, marginal groups, and communication empowerment. Okay, so we are taking a particular uh, communication and social development perspective in doing this uh, literature review. And by this uh, social development perspective, okay, we most importantly focus on the less privileged uh, people. Here are the basic questions. I, I'm just reading them very quickly. Qu research question one is what are the overall characteristics of China ICT studies, including the quantity and the val venues of publication, the theoretical perspectives and the methods used, the main subjects and topics, and their units of analysis. And then we are going to examine how research in mainland China differs from 
overseas studies and why. How they share similar strengths or weaknesses, including the neglected and excluded aspects, and also why. And how have China ICT studies, both domestically and overseas, evolved over time, and why? Right? The why question actually is more of a discussion question. And the methods, I already introduced these two basic, okay, uh, CIR bibliography, okay, I would be responsible to putting together 70% of this, uh, these references, but also my, uh, you know, colleagues, you know, on the CIR uh, Yahoo group, okay, but also the, my uh, assistant at Chinese University of Hong Kong, we work together, okay, and uh, now we actually, it's a, it's a Mandolin group, okay, uh, Han Teng is part of it, you have no problem to access it, right? Okay, so uh, people who want to download the, all the references, okay, you can join our Mandolin group, okay, to to share is an open source uh, online uh, bibliography. And here, for this study, we included uh, 501 okay, studies. Most of these are English language publications. Some of them are Chinese, but published in Hong Kong or Taiwan. Okay, so they are the, uh, overseas. But then the J and C database, I already uh, mentioned, is Bu uh, Wei uh, and uh, her team in Beijing, okay, from four mainstream journalism and communication journals. Okay, these are all Chinese language uh, publications in mainland China. And uh, the coding, I'm not going to the details, but we call the basic information, okay, title where they're published, okay, their purpose of study, okay, and then uh, because, as I said, okay, we, uh, we use a social development perspective, so we are coding whether, okay, even though most of them are not using, but we still give a zero to them, all right, the, whether they're using uh, gender perspective, Okay, whether they're looking at workers or farmers, by the way, they're still the majority of Chinese population. Okay, how many, uh, are they also looking at ethnic minorities, okay, or gender minorities, okay? So we called it that. The main subject matter, okay, and also unit of analysis and what kind of qualitative or quantitative or mixed methods that they use. This is uh, uh, the publication volume. So we can see uh, from 1989, from very few to 2000, okay, uh, this was the year of the dot-com crash, okay, there was a uh, you know, clear okay, increase for, for both overseas and uh, domestic uh, uh, studies, and then there's a decline between 2000 and 2005, okay. But after 2005, it started to increase the domestic, okay, this is the domestic public increase really quickly although not so quickly in terms of English publications, okay? However, the, the bottom, okay, this line, okay, this is SSCI, okay, publications, okay? So you can see even though the numbers goes up and down, SSCI publications is actually consistently going up, okay? So that's uh, the general publication volume. And here is the uh, purpose of study, okay? So you can see the domestic study, the overseas study, and then the total, okay? Uh, for domestic study, we can see actually the uh, purpose of study, uh, the industry and the markets, okay? This is an earlier finding from uh, Bu Wei's presentation in CERC uh, a couple of years ago, okay? Still, the media industry remains the number one to serve the me media industry and expansion. Whereas for English, uh, the overwhelming is academic discovery, okay? But at the same time, there are pu public policy, okay? But not that much as uh, we originally expected. But at the same time, uh, the discussion about civil society or democracy is actually low, you know, in both groups. So the, the, the total sample size, by the way, is uh, 705, okay, to put the two together. And then social development perspective, okay? The, you can see one way is to see how low they are, okay? This is a broadly defined of all the, you know, disadvantaged groups, okay? That are, you know, uh, uh, that are the usual suspect for social development uh, studies. But then we can look at the other way, it's like this 3% would mean 97% are not looking at social development at all, okay? It's better in the overseas, okay, but then still, even in overseas literature, the majority, okay, of the uh, studies are not, you know, uh, done from the perspective of the disadvantaged. Subject matter, okay, here are the domestic, and uh, there are, you know, very 
different technical issues. We uh, coded technical issues in a different way from uh, uh, run uh, uh, ways, okay, uh, study. So the number is lower, okay. We are, we are doing the really, really technical part. We call them technical, right? But then the great majority, the, the high numbers here, again, domestic, this is consistent. Business operation, okay, is what they are uh, looking at, okay. And, uh, but for overseas, the uh, policy and management, okay, lots of political scientists, okay, or IR scholars, okay, this is where their work would uh, show up. Okay. And, but overall, okay, because business, okay, the telecom industry, okay, is still a major part for the overseas. So it's actually, if we put the two groups together, okay, this is still the highest, okay, they look at the uh, business uh, operation. And um, intermedia relations, this is talking about how internet would interact with, for example, traditional media, okay, or even, okay, uh, personal, okay, uh, uh, traditional forms of communication. So you can see, actually, this is a main, uh, I, 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 can e I think I even use the obsession, okay, for domestic scholars to look at how internet, you know, media convergence, okay, all this kind of uh, topic is really very prominent, you know, but also for uh, overseas, okay, it's not just for the uh, uh, domestic scholars, but also mass media, so this is, oh, oh sorry, this is no discussion, but here, this is the uh, amount of who discussed, okay, uh, intermediate relationship, uh, mass media, okay, was the, uh, the, the big uh, uh, obsession, okay, and it turns out to be the very high, but the others are uh, no discussion. All right, sorry, I have to rush a little bit, okay, the role of people, okay, this is a very important one, oftentimes, okay, this is actually in part because of Gobin's call for people, we should, we should go beyond technology, you know, centrism or technology determinism, do they include people at all, you know? 79% of the domestic and uh, nearly 27% of the overseas foreign, they don't include people. It's all about technology platforms, okay? People does not exist, okay? But then, uh, of the people who exist, uh, you see consumers, okay? But then the agentic actors would be here. We can see, again, the civil society, these are what we call our activists, okay? So we see, again, the political science or IR, okay? Uh, literature influence would show up here for the overseas. Gender issues, okay, most of the uh, studies are not looking at gender, okay, whatever uh, kind of uh, gender issues. But of those who look at, they look at both genders, okay, not focusing on, okay, for example, uh, female, okay, on, on women. Who's ICT? This is about who, can, who are the main actors, okay. The, uh, for the domestic, okay, the most important actor would be Okay, not not uh, surprise. Media and website journalists, because they are mostly concerned about media, okay, operation, how newspaper incorporate internet, for example. Right? Whereas for overseas, okay, it would be the party state, okay, the, the communist party, the government. Okay, this is you know how they uh, would be mostly focusing on, but followed uh, not very far, okay, by uh, business enterprise and also average users, right? But then other, this is equally important, all right? Like farmers, only less than 1% of the domestic, okay? Slightly more, okay, for the overseas, right? <coughs> Which is why we want to do a special issue of the Chinese Journal of Communication on sent down internet, okay? Internet in rural China, okay? It's response to uh, this. And also workers is even low, okay? 0.2%, right? And senior citizens or group people with disability, okay, see, is group of disabilities, 0% of uh, the English, at least we haven't found one. If you find, you know, people studying internet and, you know, disability people within China, let us know, all right? Consequences examined, okay? Some of them did not even measure any kind of consequences, but of those who examine consequences, social, okay, turns out to be very high, okay, broadly defined social movements, okay, social equality, and, uh, but then political turns out to be very high for the overseas. Right, so again, we can see the uh, political control, okay, that discourse really uh, uh, show up here. Unit analysis, okay, macro, that by this we mean national or global, right? But then very few on meso, although there are more on micro, okay, individual level, okay, but then 
the, the, the field is very obsessed about big issues, about global or national change. Methodological approach, okay. In mainland China, there are lots of essays, shorter essays that does not really use lots of okay, uh, uh, methods, okay. Both qualitative and quantitative. Okay, so discussion. So to uh, go back to our initial question, okay. Is there change, okay, in the academy when we see so much change in the industry? So uh, the answer is uh, both yes and no, right? In general, okay, we have uh, seen, okay, uh, there are lots of change, okay, so it's yes, the China ICT studies has, have grown in volume, okay, that's a very obvious change, okay. And there are two periods of fast growth, okay, in the late 1990s and also since uh, 2005, 2006, okay. But these two fast growth periods were intercepted by a period of relative decline between 2000 and 2005. However, the SSCI okay, uh, articles keeps growing throughout the three periods. But when we look more closely, we can also say change does come, but not that much. Right? Uh, theoretically motivated research remain insufficient. Right? And domestic and uh, overseas literature remain different. Right? And both pay limited attention to the, mi to the micro and the meso and also both suffer from limited diversity, although in different ways. So the uh, overall, okay, we can, we can say there are uh, little social development perspective, okay, from the viewpoint of the disadvantaged, although overseas studies, okay, pay slightly more attention, okay, to citizen reporters and NGOs, okay. Overseas is 9%, the domestic is less than, okay, 1%. And, uh, uh, in the final analysis, we see more similarities than uh, expected between domestic and overseas uh, uh, publications, especially if we started from the old piece that uh, I did with uh, Joseph Man Chen you know, more than 10 years ago, that the two uh, okay, body of literature were really very different, but now we see a trend of convergence, okay, especially when it comes to their basic content units of analysis and the ways in which they consider who controls ICTs in China. Notable theoretical and methodological differences remain. So do you dissimilar research object, uh, objectives and the dependent variables being pursued. However, under the surface of continuing divergence, we detect more fundamental movements of convergence. For good or for bad, our field of China ICT studies no longer consists of two isolated, quote-unquote, worlds. Rather, it is probably more precisely characterized as two, quote-unquote, regions with distinct characteristics, evolving together, sharing strengths and weaknesses. Change in the media industry is perhaps a cause for this transformation in this intellectual landscape, but it is only one of the reasons. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Um, uh, I've called my presentation through the looking glass uh, because that's sort of more or less how I feel every time I sort of start looking at Chinese internet research and so on. And in a way, that's how I felt when I prepared for this conference and then submitted my article and abstract and stuff. And then I, for the first time, looked at the program and realized that the head of the organizing committee was going to give exactly the same talk I was going to give, and um, he was going to be just before me. So. Um, <laughs> Wow. I was worried. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is sort of uh, a, a paper that, that talks a bit about how strange it sometimes feels doing internet research on China. Um, th this paper has many different routes. Uh, two of those routes are actually sitting here. Uh, one of those routes is actually the paper that um, Randy published that sort of um, Jack already mentioned. Um, where he did sort of his research on, on, on meta research on what had been published on the internet in China, 
And I was simply sort of getting curious to see what had actually changed since 2005 and sort of thought, well, let, let's see whether we can meet or whether we have met any of the challenges that Randy laid down in 2005. Um, well, a glimpse towards the conclusion, we haven't actually. Okay, so in, in a way I'm going to end with the same conclusion that Randy ended with. Um, the second sort of root of this was actually um, an encounter with one of Jack's earlier articles. Um, I happened to be writing a piece on, on censorship and something, as I think everybody who deals with Chinese internet research does at some point. And um, for some unrelated reasons, I was looking through some old Google Scholar type um, publications and came across a, an article Jack had written in 2000. And uh, I was sort of curious what he'd written back then and, and sort of discovered to my horror that his article from 2000 was making every single point that I had been planning to make, <laughs> uh, which then caused me to basically chuck my whole draft and um, do something completely different. But it also sort of created in me the desire to actually try and find out what has actually been going on, what have people actually been researching and what haven't we been researching. Okay, and so <laughs> that's sort of a bit of the backstory of this. Um, a final disclaimer, I'm only going to give you about half of the story of this research at the moment, or maybe even only a third, uh, because um, my PhD student is actually going to give the second half of this paper um, at ICAS in two weeks in Macau. So if you want to hear more details, just go to ICAS. <laughs> So yeah, as I said, so the starting point was simply trying to find out what have we actually done and uh, what would have people been publishing on and so on. Um, but one of the, the interesting bits for me is then that um, essentially for the last 20 years by now, I mean 1994 was the earliest one we, we found, um, people have been saying that the internet or uh, BBSs or forums or blogs or nowadays Weibo or Weixin, are going to bring democracy to China, okay? And quite a few of these here, actually, I think um, in Taubman's 98 piece, he actually basically said explicitly that uh, the Chinese Communist Party wasn't, didn't stand a chance against this because um, they just had to roll over because everybody was now online and therefore this was all going to be very democratic in China. And it, an amazing thing about this whole list is also that um, Essentially, nobody quotes anybody else on the list. Sort of thing. Um, it's, we, we seem to have, if we are actually a discipline, which I actually doubt at the moment, um, this, this network concept maybe, but um, not in terms of reading, I think. Um, the, the thing is, if you look at what people have published, most of us tend to only put into our bibliography stuff that has been published during the last three or four years. Okay? And we don't look back any further. And I think that's a big mistake we're making because, yeah, we are essentially repeating the same research over and over. I mean, Peter said this yesterday um, in the first session um, that when they were looking through the graduate papers for, submitted for this conference, that one of the problems <coughs> was that a lot of the methods used, topics addressed, conclusions that they came to were the same people have been publishing about already, okay? But people are not actually checking what has been done already. <coughs> So, and I'm guilty of that as well, as I said, as I found out with Jack's paper. And then I started this sort of research. Now, the methodology was fairly simple. We went and started by looking at scholar.google.com and tried to track down anything we could find um, that had been published on the Chinese internet. For every single publication, we then wanted to get, well, just, I say, we wanted to get these points, a so year of publication, first author, and then we decided, well, it might be a nice idea to find out where this stuff is published, but how do you do that? Do you sort of guess from the name of the author where they're from or where their spiritual home might be or something? So in the end, we decided to go with departmental affiliation of the first author. This had the advantage that we could sort of um, assign people to countries, um, but it had the drawback that several people who moved from country to country in their academic careers suddenly ended up several times in our database. Okay, so th this is a drawback, but um, it didn't actually affect the data too much, as you'll see. 
Um, the same thing, sort of title, abstract, or summary. Um, yeah, a lot of people basically don't do abstracts, it seems, or a lot of journals don't do abstracts. So um, we had to put together a summary of this. And then we decided to collect keywords as well in the hopes of doing a lot with that. Um, this backfired a bit on us because most of the keywords were either too global. I mean, almost everybody simply had the keyword Chinese internet. Um, I mean, you can't use that then. Um, or it was too specific. Um, say that somebody had sort of Bo um, Silai as a keyword or something like that. Um, so in the end, we ended up creating a lot of our own keywords. Um, at the end of the collection, we managed to get together 800 different entries. Um, and we collected the stuff for all of them. Um, however, then again, we ran into problems simply with yeah, the internet. One of the good things during the last few years is that um, increasingly universities have insisted on um, making publications of their staff available for free online as well, in sort of pre-publication drafts. But then we realized that we actually had a number of pre-publication drafts in our database that then had been published with slightly different names for the same contents. And that's why we then ended up with sort of cleaning up this a bit and then sort of from 800 it went down to 590 that we ended up with. Okay? So this is 590 publications that we had in there published between 1994 and 2013. We then added uh, our own keywords to find a bit of structure in there, sort of business, international issues, politics, society, and then theory and methods publications. So, the results. Um, first of all, who are we? Um, surprising to us was um, that it seems by far the most people who publish on the Chinese internet are actually in departments of communication or schools of communication. Um, which um, gives us, I guess, a certain flavor in the way we study things. Um, what was extremely surprising to me personally was that um, something, say, like uh, media studies came up with only three publications in the 20 years. Okay, I mean, this is sort of amazed me, really. Um, but even things like um, social science in general, political science, information studies, or here business studies, um, again, there were not as many people publishing there as we expected. Okay. Um, this maybe also explains why, uh, say, yesterday, several people who presented uh, started their presentation with disclaimers, sort of saying, uh, okay, um, I'm presenting here, but I'm really a cultural studies person. Or, yes, I'm presenting here, but I'm really a media studies person. So, almost um, asking for forgiveness for intruding or something like that. Uh, it was very interesting. So, it, it seems, yes, we are focused on communication studies. Um, then, if you group this a bit uh, together, then, yeah, you see this, as I said, largest area is communication, and then closely followed by four similar areas. Business, uh, sort of computing IT stuff, uh, then we have political studies and social and cultural together and so on. Um, and that's sort of the main areas where people actually come from. Um, in terms of where do we work, um, again, a bit of a shock for many, uh, because, yeah, over the last 20 years, almost everybody who was published on the Chinese internet was sitting in the US at a computer and was typing about China. Um, 232 publications out of the 590 uh, were done by people who, at the time, were affiliated with a US institution or US university or something, okay? Um, uh, Another slight surprise was that actually 141 publications, the authors, said that at the time of publication, and this is English language publication, at the time of publication, they were affiliated with an institution inside mainland China, uh, which was sort of surprising. And um, if you then sort of look at what we've created here, sort of Greater China, which is essentially yeah, China, Taiwan, um, Hong Kong, and Macau, um, they get close to the US numbers of publications, but um, Europe actually looks very bad on this. Um, <laughs> it's sort of, I mean, th this actually really worried us, although um, in the end we, we sort of figured out, well, this is English language publications, and um, 
the thing is that there is actually in existence quite a publication scene, for example, in Germany or in France or in Spain or in Sweden in local languages um, that are not published in English and, to our surprise actually, are not even referred to in the bibliographies or reference lists of people publishing in English. Um, so there seems to be very little overlap between these things. Uh, publications per year, our, our statistics looked slightly different from Jack's. We didn't have this, this big sort of gap, I think he had, sort of, it went down for him between 2000 and 2005 or something. For us it's sort of more of a steady growth. Um, there's sort of a slight dip, sort of around 2006, 2007, and, and I'll get back to that in a minute with sort of more details. But in general, yeah, we're a fairly healthy discipline with growing numbers of publications across the board. Um, in terms of um, the areas that people sort of publish about, this is sort of our own keywords. Um, most of the people publish on social issues, uh, society-based stuff, mm -hmm. social movements and things like that. 35% um, publish on politics, and these are sort of the big two issues. Um, with then business coming in a third, okay? And if we look at this over time, um, then we'll actually get sort of our dips. Um, you have sort of the, this is this one, um, the business line sort of going up sort of around 2000 and so on when the dot-com stuff was happening and then sort of went down slightly. Then people discovered uh, blogs and personal marketing, so it went up again. And, that crashed a bit, then people discovered social networking and went up again, and so business sort of just kept going up and down, similar to what you might find for uh, publications outside um, China. Uh, the social studies have actually taken off slightly later than the other studies, um, but are now essentially the way of the future in a way. Um, so the people weren't that focused on society, but now increasingly society and social issues, people's sort of personal opinions about the internet, social movements and so on, as we've seen yesterday as well. This is the growing topic area. Politics used to be extremely interesting and stuff. We have this weird dip here in our data. Uh, and honestly, I don't know whether this is just a fault of our data or uh, whether this is sort of similar to say, uh, the thing that happened in, say, the, the overseas media when they were reporting about China, because if you looked at, say, Guardian reporting or New York Times reporting, between sort of 2006, 2007, up until 2008, they were all very nice to China. This was sort of in the run-up to the Olympics and so on, and suddenly people talked nice about China. And it seems almost as if people also then didn't publish anything really political on China or less political stuff. But as I said, I don't know yet whether this is simply a whole of things that we haven't found yet, or whether this is really a, um, a significant topic change there. In terms of uh, looking at the four largest sort of areas of, of people's affiliations, I mean, we have the US, we have China, Hong Kong, and then the UK. Um, we also found it interesting that uh, in different places, people focus on different things. This is something Jack already mentioned. Um, that essentially you have for the Westerners, so UK and US, uh, the focus is basically on politics. Um, while for sort of China, Hong Kong, the focus is mainly on social issues, social movements, and so on. Okay. Um, there's sort of the other funny thing that we found is um, out of the articles on politics that were written, so these here, these 101 here, so basically the green ones here. When we look more closely at those, in the US, 88 of those articles were essentially saying that the internet will bring democracy to China. Um, 13 were de sort of dealing with other sort of politics stuff. Um, and similar sort of thing in the UK, while you don't get that sort of same uh, relationship in, in China and Hong Kong. Um, one funny sort of factoid from our data is also, um, there's quite a lot of publications on the psychology, uh, psychology of the internet or psychological effects of the internet. But every single article that has been written about the psychological effect of the internet 
was written by an author with a Chinese name. Um, it seems nobody with a non-Chinese name publishes on the psychological effects of the internet. It's sort of an interesting factor out of, out of our yeah. data, but it's sort of, I'm not really sure yet whether this really explains anything or so, but it's very interesting to see. So non-Chinese essentially seem to be focusing more on politics and democratizing influence. The Chinese more, it seems, on social issues and psychological effects, as I mentioned. So ultimately, the questions that we generated out of this, and as I said, so my, my PhD student will do a lot of qualitative stuff, content analysis of the abstracts and so on in, in two weeks at ICAS. But uh, the questions that we came up with were sort of, it's something that came up yesterday as well. Um, we, we keep emphasizing that China is different in the internet, and a lot of these studies do. But in many ways, we haven't actually proved our point yet. Um, in, in many ways, uh, we're doing what Jim Leibold actually calls this sort of digital orientalism, <laughs> that we're sort of imagining that China is different, it has to be different, and therefore, we, we create all these studies that show, oh yeah, Chinese are doing this and, and stuff. And, and the, the question is whether they're really that different from other people. Um, and I think we have so far not really proved this yet. Um, the second one is also, um, there's a bit of the, the uh, uh, developmental determinism throughout these studies in, in that uh, there's a thinking that everybody will end up the same on the internet. So. For example, um, as you mentioned already, with sort of dot-com studies in the US, uh, then shortly afterwards there were dot-com studies on the Chinese internet. With blog studies and their influence on politics in the US, shortly afterwards people looked at blog studies in, the, in China and how they inf uh, sort of affected politics. Then you have Facebook studies in the US, you have um, Renren studies and Kaixin studies in China. You have Twitter studies, you have then uh, Weibo studies and so on. So it was sort of more or less, yeah, China will end up using the same things as we do, they're just a bit behind us or something. Um, this goes through a lot of stuff, and again, it, it's something that we haven't really, I think, thought through and haven't really argued or proved properly yet. Um, the, the, the final thing, this is sort of something that um, hopefully is disappearing at the moment a bit. Um, there were sort of the first indications uh, at this conference, um, that, that somehow China has to follow the West in how internet develops and how people use things and, and what can be done with the internet and so on. And, and I mean, there were some of the first indications, say, when people started mentioning that Huawei is actually doing stuff internationally now, and so China might have a greater influence on how the internet is developing and what is happening with the internet. Um, or, I mean, if you've followed the news in the UK, um, seven days ago, um, a young woman here in the UK uh, posted a thoughtless comment on Twitter about um, the knifing of that soldier. And um, she essentially posted something uh, on Twitter. She didn't know yet how severe it was at the time, but she posted something on, well, anybody who wears that kind of T-shirt deserves to be beheaded, okay? Thoughtless thing, meaningless. On Twitter, this caused a storm with lots of people threatening to rape her, kill her, burn down her house and everything. She got scared. Undergraduate student, she got scared. She shut down her computer and then carried the computer to the police and so told the police that she was scared because so many people were threatening her. Police looked at this whole thing and then what did they do? They arrested her. <laughs> this young woman was actually sentenced now the young woman was sentenced, almost, was sentenced to prison. The only reason why she wasn't sent to prison is because she and her father had been doing aid work in the Sudan and sort of other places in Africa. And so the, the sort of people in the court felt that, oh, she didn't deserve that harsh a punishment. But in the end, she was actually given 250 hours of community service for this weird comment, okay? Interesting, isn't it? So, what is the internet doing to people? Um, is the internet changing us? Is the internet changing Western societies? Um, it's sort of interesting stuff. So, at the end of this, as I promised, I, I wanted to end 
with um, the comment that um, Randy made at, at the end of his paper. Essentially, internet studies or Chinese internet studies will need to apply the theoretical and methodological sophistication that has developed over, by now, two decades of work to the experiences of the nations that will comprise the next wave of internet expansion, growth, and transformation. And I think we, don't, we haven't quite done this yet. We haven't quite reached that level of sophistication yet. Um, there's also this comment by Jim Leibold, who has a, a fantastic turn of phrase, um, who essentially also challenges us to do more comparative, more cross-disciplinary research, and to look at whether Chinese citizens are employing these new platforms in fundamentally different ways, or whether they're doing the same thing. Might the passage of time reveal that the digital activism required to ignite a prairie fire of revolutionary democratic change in China is being snuffed out by the dull flicker and gentle tapping of millions of isolated individual computers and their smiley face bloggers? <laughs> Fantastic. Huh? Um, yeah, essentially, I think we have done a lot of really good work over the last 20 years. It's sort of we, we are worth, I mean, we can give ourselves a pat on the back to some extent. But I also think that there's huge areas that we've so far left blank and that we should engage in. Um, I do believe that we should really start looking a bit more critically at some of the things we claim are different in China. I think we should look a bit more critically at the things that we claim are due to the internet and also on how we combine these two things. Thank you very much. Wonderful, we have about uh, 15 minutes for discussions. Um, the floor is open. No, this is essentially the, the argument that, um, say, uh, the internet is too big, the Chinese government can't control it. Um, the, uh, um, the Great Firewall doesn't really work, and so people get all the information, and again, the Chinese government can't control it. Um, or the, the argument that um, there's too many levels of conflicting government in China, and they have different perspectives on the internet, so in the end, again, they can't control it. Um, then um, every single new technology that entered China, from the internet to blogs to forums, to basically that was supposed to now change the world and, and uh, bring democracy to China. So it was all really very deterministic. Uh, at the end of thanks, that's a great question. At the end of our uh, uh, paper, I hope you know you can get access to. Okay, we raised the four questions, two of which we cannot answer in this paper. 
Okay? And let me read this to you. There are, you, you, you know, uh, in many ways, uh, also echoing what you're saying. Number one is, uh, has China internet studies grown, in, uh, grown to similar scale and uh, sophistication? as its Western or Anglo-American counterparts, even surpassing them. So it's to compare China ICT studies with the Western okay, ICT studies. The other is how does China ICT studies compare to other counterparts, such as Japan, Korea ICT studies, or India? Okay, as, uh, we posed this question at the end, but we would love to have okay, all our Korean, Japanese, Indian uh, you know, friends working together, but we, we haven't done that yet. But I agree. I think there are something probably you know that can be generalized, but I don't know what exactly they are. Yeah. I, um, it, yeah. In terms of generalization, I, I think a lot of the things that we are doing on the Chinese internet, either they have come to some extent from uh, part of what we've done with internet studies in general. Or, I mean, several of us are working both Chinese internet studies and they're doing some general stuff as well. So I think there is some back and forth, not as much as I would like, but there is some there already. In terms of what should be, we be careful about, I mean, one of the things that struck me while, while doing this and um, writing about something else this year, it was um, we're all using Chinese language sources as sort of, um, evidence and data points for a lot of the stuff that we're doing about the Chinese internet. I mean, we're, we're reading Weibo, we're reading Chinese websites and blogs and so on, and, and talking about this, but um, very few, if any, of the studies that we had in our research um, quote research by Chinese colleagues published in Chinese. Um, say, the, the very nice database that, that you guys had there with sort of the 1,200 publications in Chinese on the Chinese internet, um, we don't refer to those. Um, we, we don't interact with those really, okay? And one of the funny things I found out was even, say, um, people who had their affiliation in mainland China who published in English still did not actually refer back to Chinese language publications, academic publications on the internet. So in a way it was, I mean, I'm an anthropologist, so um, for me this was sort of um, going back to lots of uh, discussions about colonialism, post-colonialism that we've had in anthropology during the 80s and 90s and so on, but it was sort of almost, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be very provocative now. Uh, somebody said it was almost as if, yeah, Chinese are good enough to be data, but they're not good enough to be our academic colleagues or something. And I felt really uncomfortable with that. And um, I see this as a danger, especially as we don't even have the excuse that, oh, well, the Chinese is a difficult language and we can't read it because we do read it for our data. We just don't read it for engagement with the academics. So. I just want to add one word here. I think there, uh, what you're talking, you know, David talking about here is something I feel very, I think Bu Wei feels similarly you know, strongly about this, is the need to decolonize okay, China internet studies. Yeah, I, I want to leave me make three quick points. One is I think that the, um, introducing the idea of Orientalism and decolonization of internet studies is a really important especially because, as I think both papers talked about, there's a lot of techno-determinism in the field. And so if one is writing about marriage uh, or you know, gender relations, it's easier to see that Orientalism might come in uh, by people exporting from the West values that they associate with the West and then projecting it onto Chinese uh, or other cultures. So I think that's a really Point. Two other things that struck me, one sort of related to this, um, perhaps, is some of your comments reminded me of what uh, Sun Sun Lim was saying yesterday about is there a Asian or Chinese way of approaching these topics that's quite distinct from, uh, uh, from others. And that's sort of what I guess both papers were getting at. Um, and so it might be interesting to try to combine those two discourses into one. Um, the, but what did strike me is the large number of uh, Western 
analysts that seem to talk about agency and, and the people question. And a relatively small number of things published either in Chinese or people with Chinese surnames, etc. And I'd like maybe some, to sort of, if the panel could address that a bit. And does that reflect arguably Western notions of individualism, looking at more agency than structure? But maybe it could be a structural issue. Or does it reflect political realities of the ability to do research in China on sensitive subjects? So that's, and then the, the final quick point I, I wanted to make is um, what came up in I think some of David's work is that um, arguably the whole entire field of communication is not the strongest field in the West. I mean, this is sort of a dirty little secret, and certainly as the dean of a communication school, I shouldn't be saying this. <laughs> but um, if one looks at the intellectual rigor, breadth, et cetera, of a lot of the work in mainstream American communication and contrast it to what's happening in other fields or disciplines like um, sociology, economics, etc. A lot of communication gets about a C to a C minus. A lot of the literature relative to other fields. So I, I think there it may be, uh, we, may, we may be seeing that the, the work in China could actually be applied back to other fields because it looks like it might be better than the mainstream work that's being done in the United States. So I guess I, with those two sort of perverse questions, one is sort of the, why, why the structure agency difference uh, that showed up so much in, in the data. Uh, I guess that would be the, the big sort of question beyond the comments. Um, in, in terms of the structure and agency, um, I hadn't actually thought about it in those terms, but um, in the, the full paper that was uploaded to the SSR Insight, um, I actually mentioned at the end that um, while I was writing an article about Han Han, China's biggest blogger and uh, blogger hero, um, I actually came across a very lively academic discourse published in Chinese, in Chinese language academic <coughs> publications on Han Han that is completely unknown um, outside China. So uh, at least there you had a lot of stuff on agency, on individuals doing things and so on. It's just that doesn't seem to be reflected in actually English language publications then. Because, and I, I don't really know why they don't make that jump. But it might also be simply because these sorts of articles don't get accepted. Um, for example, the, the article I was writing back then on Han Han, um, the first time I submitted it, um, I got it back from the editor almost immediately telling me that, oh, too much had been written about Han Han already. Uh, the funny thing there is I have yet not been able to find a single English language academic publication on Han Han. Um, but it simply wasn't worth talking about. So I, I'm, I'm not quite sure whether this always reflects sort of how people think or whether this has also to do with the, I don't know, it's sort of a dirty word almost, but lots of people have used it here already, the political economy of the publishing world in academia um, and, and how that structures what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable discourse. Okay, the, uh, about the structure agency uh, question. Is there a Chinese way to approach ICT studies? I tried my best, maybe you saw it to get uh, a way to answer this question, but uh, <laughs> she keeps telling me. So I think this is a Chinese approach too. You know, to let me take the, uh, and answer the question. But uh, she will jump in. You know, uh, anytime she, she she likes. She actually, you know, without her, I won't even start to do this. And but I think that uh, because we're doing an empirical project, so I'm I'm not giving you a theoretic answer. Could there be one in the future? Okay, could there be a person? Okay, maybe Bu Wei is. Uh, one of them, okay, to embody this Chinese approach, okay, and uh, the I was immediately coming up, coming to my mind would be Min Da Hong. I don't know whether you have met him, but uh, he's very little known, but uh, uh, from colleague. yeah, this Bu yeah. is many years uh, colleague, and uh, he's never trained in the in the Western countries, okay, and then he uh, he he was sort of marginalized after eighty nine, right? 
Okay, but then he, he was actually a very influential, okay, for the first generation of domestic Chinese uh, internet research, okay, from uh, his uh, family name is Min, M-I-N, and the first name is Da Hong, D-A-H-O-N-G. <laughs> And the only, I, I, the, only thing, the only English literature that ever mentioned him, he published many, many in, in the JNC, the, the Chinese database. But the only one is in the special issue, I think was China Information, but correct me if I'm wrong, because we all, you are also included in that. Uh, it was, was Johan Lakovist, was our Swedish uh, you know, colleague. He edited a special issue called, the, oh, I think it's called Contemporary Chinese Thoughts. Contemporary Chinese Thoughts. Yeah, so it's a... Uh, it's a, a European journal, okay, and it has a special issue, I think, six, five years ago, and uh, including Min Da Hong and also uh, Hu Yong, okay, their interview, their ideas in Chinese, and then they were tra translated into English. This is one of the very few, okay, people, okay, and I, I won't have the time to elaborate what exactly, but uh, I want to give the name. There are people who already have been doing, you know, the uh, kind of uh, research. They're, they're very little known in the English uh, literature. Um, now, we started late, uh, I think 10 minutes late, so would you mind if we have uh, 10 extra minutes of discussion? And I see a lot of hands already, so I'm going to collect questions instead of doing it one by one. So we have Bill, Peter, and uh, uh, Florian first. Okay, I'll be very quick. I, I think that it's a genuine problem to have more homegrown research on the internet in China. and. But I think, I'm, I'm trying to think of the risk. One is the, uh, first of all, the growth is probably even more positive than you both painted it, because if you compare the growth of internet research in China with the growth of other research, like, uh, I mean, if you look at internet studies generally, it's growing faster than almost any field other than environmental research. Or, so, so compared to other fields, its growth is incredible. And, um, but I'm, I'm just thinking, of being in the UK, it's very interesting, because we're a little country. <laughs> and in the US, we used to do internet research. We're not about the US. We just think research in the US was the internet. <laughs> you know, we're like the World Series or whatever. But whatever happened in the US is sort of like applies to other. In the UK, uh, I quickly learned, you know, if you send in an article, what, what's going on in the UK? Who cares? You know, this is a little country. This is not important. But I think it's like be careful that we don't get into a situation of writing about China as important in itself. And it's like, um, it, even though it is the largest country online and so forth, the idea of the UK has a good discipline. Is like, what can I do about research in, on the internet in the UK that carries beyond the UK? and uh, that, that has some kind of resonance theoretically or otherwise that people might try to apply this perspective. And so I think this kind of, yeah, be careful that we don't overcorrect. And you know, the, I guess that would be something. So we'll, we'll get responses until we get Peter's and Florence's questions and we can respond there. So, so, well, so one question and one observation for both papers. So the question is that have you focused on the repeat players? Because to some extent, a lot of the one-off uh, one player will steal the data because they'll create a lot of noise and they might not come back to the field. And we see that in CERC as well as other forum. Uh, some people will just focus on Chinese internet uh, for one paper and then they'll never come back. So that's the first question. The second one is more the observation. What I see in the search and did uh, you guys have uh, with respect to Western publications or non-Chinese publications is actually not that different from other fields of Chinese studies whether it's legal studies or whether it's human rights. So there are major events, whether it's uh, Tiananmen in 1989, or WTO accession in 2000, or Beijing Olympics, or even if we go more local, with respect to all the different internet incidents, you can see a huge surge just because of how timely the topic is. But a lot, a lot of times, uh, you bring in other people who might not be writing about communication studies and just tap in the field because of that type of opportunity. I guess my, my question is actually quite related to the kind of behavior uh, that you see from the people who are working on the subject. So I really like your, your statistics of how many people publish and how the US and, and greater China are dominant uh, on the topic. And I'm wondering whether that's not a reflection of publication habits rather than of actual research practice. So I'm wondering, is there any way to figure out whether Europeans who may publish once every other year rather than every semester might have a similar impact as the Western <laughs> ones or not, or whether that actually Maybe that actually doesn't matter in publications, everything, like the quantitative and all that. Okay, so 
responses, please. Okay, very quickly. Uh, I cannot agree with Bill Moore about this. Actually, this time last year, I was, I was in the summer doctor program talking about, okay, uh, my, the a subtitle of my talk was China is not interesting. <laughs> what interesting is the interesting theoretical question. Okay, <laughs> don't, don't tell me because it's China, so therefore we do it, okay. And uh, um, uh, there's another thing to be added. Actually, because of time, we didn't you know, have uh, you know, uh, mention all the details. One of the things we were very aware Okay, for the domestic study, we only got four journals that are publicly accessible. There are tons of stuff, for example, on social media in China that are not in the public domain. Okay, we are f very much aware of that. Okay, the corporations or the, the governments, okay, they're doing that and they're not sharing with that. So, uh, and they have more resources maybe than universities. Okay, so we are aware of that uh, 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 at the same time. Uh, Repeated players, we don't have uh, data yet. Maybe, I think, uh, our, you know, uh, uh, David's data it would be more precise, okay, to getting closer to what Peter is talking about here. But in our, you know, uh, you know general overview, we haven't got into the repeat. It's an important question, but we don't have data to support that. And also uh, about uh, cross-field comparison. My gut feeling, although again, I don't have empirical data, is similar to yours, okay? There are the, the patterns, okay, from legal studies and ICT studies, there could be quite a lot of uh, uh, parallel. And uh, the last question about the European approach, uh, I also cannot agree more. Like I mentioned, uh, uh, Johan Lackaby's work, okay? Uh, he's based in Stockholm, and the unique thing he did to be a bridge, okay, that, uh, Professor Wu Mei mentioned this morning, okay, to translate Min Da Hong's work into English is no other, nobody, you know, in other, you know, uh, North America or even Asia has been doing. Okay, so there is a very definitive role played by European, uh, you know, uh, scholars and uh, personally, you know, I, this is my personal view, I, I haven't talked to the organization. Okay, we are, we are not in the EU yet, okay, but if in the future uh, EU countries would like to host the CERC, uh, I think most of our you know, colleagues would, would love it. Yeah, Thank you. yeah and, um, I agree with Bill as well. So you, you're doing the research, although I, I don't quite agree with just going for theories and method. But, um, I think a lot of the social scientists have talked themselves into a corner doing that, and then and they became irrelevant because they then went into theoretical and methodological spirals and stuff. But, and, and, but yeah, we should definitely sort of be careful that we don't emphasize, as I said earlier, that China is the be-all, end-all, or that's so different from, from everything else. Um, then, uh, with Peter's comment on the um, repeat authors or one-off authors, in a way, yeah, I could pull this out of our database as well, but um, uh, in a way, yeah, somebody like um, Jack or something uh, weighs far more heavily in the database with, say, I think it's about 20 publications or something. Um, than somebody who just has a one-off publication in there. Um, so in a way that was reflected already in the data um, that I showed. So the one-off authors, I mean, yeah, they're one-off and therefore it's not that much weight there, so to say, um, in many ways. So if they do their um, fly-by publishing or something, then yeah, we, we can deal with that, I guess. So, and, and the data, it doesn't really matter that much. Um, but. I could actually adjust the analysis that we've done by, say, inc only including people who've published at least four articles or something, or it uh, depends what we want to do, but it's possible, yeah. And um, then Florian's thing uh, about uh, yeah, publication practices and impact and stuff. And I, while I agree with your point that, I, of course, say, and academics from other places that have maybe less crazy publication requirements than some <laughs> others um, might have bigger impact because their studies have greater depth or something. I, while I agree with that, yes. Um, I do see the danger though that, um, as our data shows as well, that a lot of these nice deep impact, deep thinking type scholars, um, they're not really present. And, and that is a problem. I mean, yesterday we talked already about the fact that um, Although there's a lot of um, interesting research on China going on in Germany, in Italy, in Sweden, in Holland, and that's only the places I know of, um, they're not really that represented here, okay? And uh, if they're not represented, then yes, they, they do have less of 
actually a, an impact on what everybody else is doing as well. Um, this is partly a problem of sort of um, the English-speaking world usually only reading English language materials. Um, it would be great if all of us could speak sort of 20 languages and read and write in them, but um, that's simply not the case. And so people who don't publish in English simply don't get read most of the time. And so I find it interesting to look at some of the other publications and I learn from them, but very often, hmm, yeah. Okay, I think we have only a little time for one more round of questions. Keep your questions brief and responses. I will ask by the reviewer to write something about Twitter. It's not that I don't write about Twitter because I understand what it is. So I find there's a lot of comparative things already written in the text, particularly in the discussion. So my first question is if your uh, analysis include the variable of comparative study in your, in your analysis. That may cover some of the nature to find out the difference between China and China. In both uh, presentations, you identify a lot of characteristics about the China in the research. But I would argue, basically, every kind of country based internet research share the same characteristics. Singapore, internet research, Indian, Japanese, uh, internet research, Japanese, Indian, Indian, basically, have the same thing. If you can find something really Chinese characteristics. Yeah, I, I was very interested in uh, the focus on people because I think the invitation to focus on the internet is an invitation to focus on technology. But over the 13 years that this group has been meeting, there have been lots more human contacts between people from China and the rest of the world. Thousands of Chinese graduate students studying in the United States, not just in communication studies but in other academic fields, that are all keeping very lively networks of connection with people they study with and those at home. And that's having a huge impact. Uh, travel by Americans or Brits or, or uh, Australians, other Westerners to China is way up, and likewise travel by Chinese outside of China is way up. As all of these kinds of connections occur, the technology may be in some sense less significant than the other kinds of deepening of social network. It's faster to send an email than to, to write a letter. But the fact is, when people know each other now, they exchange business cards, they exchange information. You, you can make telephone calls more cheaply than before, text messaging. So I think it's the human contacts that have to be really in the focus of much of the research. And it's the human contacts that will make the attempt to, to deal with the political impacts of the internet more difficult. Even if you can do searches that get blocked because you use yellow duckies to stand for Tiananmen protesters, people still know that there's a representation occurring, and the elites in China are more connected than have, they have ever been before. So I was wondering, to what extent you um, noticed that there's an overlap in the theoretical So in terms of the interest in theoretical discussions, the scholarly discussion of the literature in China and abroad, um, and Thank you. Uh, I mean, I was really fascinated by Jack's point about migrants, elderly people, disabled people, and young people, maybe the people who are using the internet most in China, and how our publications don't seem to reflect that, uh, and the, the amount of publications on these groups of people are 
comparatively tiny. And I wondered uh, if it means, you know, if this selectivity of what we're looking at means whether we as academics perhaps have to make the hard choice of reconsidering who we engage with and who we spend our time with on a daily basis and really just to ask what we want academia and what we want our jobs to do, you know, <laughs> and who we want to serve. Yeah. Did you, yeah. uh, did you give a Jack and David response? Oh, one sentence response? Uh, that was not my point. It was Wei's point, okay? About, <laughs> about, about we need to, about the, uh, we the need to look into the, the disadvantaged groups, and they are the bulk of the uh, market. And uh, in our paper, we actually had more discussion on the theoretical uh, orientations. However, uh, our coding, that's the one we don't feel comfortable enough to present that data. Okay, we actually quoted the kind of theory being uh, used in both overseas and domestic, but uh, there are some data problems we haven't cleaned up. We should clean up uh, pretty soon, okay? So that's something we are, we are uh, working on. And uh, again, the human contact, okay? Uh, I, I would love, okay, it, I, I think that would fit more into David's, okay, where these people are coming from, because this is something, uh, David's paper is so much stronger than ours, okay, to, to add that into the institutional, okay. I think the, uh, this is part of the uh, academia, okay, changes, not only at the publication level, but also at the human to human level, okay. Thanks a lot for David? the great question. Yeah, I agree with everything you said. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all, thank our panelists. Yeah.